it's a magnifying glass on the human condition right now. I don't like to be, greet people wearing a mask. So when I'm far away from them, I have my mask off and I put it on and you know, various things to try and keep them comfortable. Whenever I finish a shift, my, when I come home from work, especially if I'm on nights, my boyfriend can't believe my face because it is bruised across my nose. This bridge of my nose is bright red and I have um, imprints of the mask all down my face. We have certain states here that are taking this very seriously. We have other states that are not and they do not have any quarantine uh, guidelines or restrictions in place. And it's like, you know, it's like having a section of the pool where it's okay to piss in. It doesn't matter. It's not going to help. My daughter doesn't live with me. So seeing her at FaceTime, I haven't seen her for like a few months now. And, um, Just that worry that you might not see people again, man. Has anyone else watched TV and you're suddenly aware of how much people are touching their faces and touching each other and hugging each other and being around each other and licking each other's stuff? It's just crazy. Do you know, I've not been wearing makeup and I've been doing nothing to my hair. I've actually done my hair specifically for this video, so you should count yourself lucky. I'm just beginning to slightly worry about going to the supermarket and wondering who touched my supermarket trolley before me. There will be a shift, and what I'm seeing at an individual level is that people are individually shifting. So I think if, if individuals, enough individuals shift, then collectively we could shift into um, a more aware and caring way of life. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, I have been eating, sleeping, I've been washing my hands more than I ever had in my whole life. I've started running a bit. I'm definitely eating a bit too much junk. That's changing. I've learned to live on a, a sleep on the floor in a mattress. We spent a collective five hours nearly on the phone the other day. On a Sunday, wasn't it? Since COVID-19, uh, my time has been spacious. <laughs> uh, also, our house is tidier than it's ever been. <laughs> I've been using the time to not drink. Um, it's probably the biggest detox, four or five weeks under lockdown will be the biggest detox I've had since I'm about 15. For me personally, at the moment, I've noticed that I think I'm actually happier. I've taken this time as a chance for me to, to change um, my ways of thinking. And then often by the evening, I'm finding a bit more peace and just sort of being a bit kinder to myself and saying, hey man, you're doing all right, you just, just hang in there. <laughs> COVID-19 has affected me mostly emotionally. Pretty much overnight, I lost all my work. So I went from having a decent income um, to having an income of flat zero. I don't know one person that hasn't been affected. And I think what's happening with the COVID-19 outbreak is that people are being really confronted by their own personal issues. But they're also, it seems, be really ready to work quite deeply. What's been harder is the emotional side of things. Is thinking about losing people that are close to me, watching the world change so quickly. OK, so what, I don't have... Nobody has a job. Everybody just has to be locked in their house. People have got nowhere to run. There's no distraction. So people are perhaps feeling more deeply into themselves. And I see quite a lot of transformation taking place, which is actually quite heartening. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, I feel like the government have been a bit slow. I got a letter, I think it was last week, saying what we all need to do and we need to self-isolate and what do we do if we're ill, that we need to ring 111 and all that from the government. And I laughed because I thought, what's the point now? The, the sort of solutions they've come up with have been pretty lacklustre. I think the big one, which has been a real shame, is... Um, I mean, I think this was the perfect opportunity to, to implement a universal basic income. Every government is reacting differently and we don't really know what works yet. We have a president that comes on television and um, he says that, you know, 200,000 dead is a, is a good situation. Well, that's not a good situation. This is, um, you know, this is the United States. That's a fucking terrible situation. And early on, they were telling us not to wear masks. And we don't know why. Maybe they knew that there wouldn't be enough when it came down to it, but that, that has been disturbing. I think that they're doing okay. 
I think they're also responding when they're being challenged as well. And they're trying to factor in everybody in society. Politics in the last year and a half, two years, two and a half years. I don't trust our government. I'll be honest, I don't trust them to not use this situation to gain more power. We spent hours discussing conspiracy theories. I don't think any of us are in a position to judge, uh, actually. Prime Minister's got the virus, as is his health minister, as is the chief health officer as well. I wonder how Boris Johnson will feel about it now after having it and um, after being in the NHS and having intensive care. So um, I'm sure he appreciated the care that they gave um, and saw the, the, the stress that, um, that everyone's under. So um, I'm very pleased that he's a lot better. I feel like he's going to let the NHS be run into the ground and then guess what? The private companies will buy the whole thing out in the name of national security. If people start to appreciate the NHS now, you know, if Boris Johnson is being looked after and not privately, but in an NHS ICU, then I think he should appreciate it and fund it and not privatise any part of the NHS. It's undermined our systems. Um, all the things we've been told can't happen, for example, homeless people being taken off the streets. I mean, that could have been sorted out a long time ago, suddenly Boris Johnson says he's um, he's giving beds to all the homeless who aren't any homeless anymore. Okay, right. Why the bollocks didn't you do that before? And when Boris Johnson said, um, oh, you will get family members that will die. Like, no. He, he said you will lose loved ones. And it's just like, no, put everyone in quarantine and then it'll be fine. Because he let loved ones die before he put everyone in quarantine. And some of these politicians are not going to come out of it well. Since COVID hit, there have been a lot of stories around the virus. I had to come away from social media for a bit. I was like, Do you know what, I need to come away, especially with being ill with it. It was just freaking me out. So I'm like, I don't need to know this because this information don't make sense. Since my job finished, since I got home, that's what I've been doing. Like, I have the news on in the morning, I have the news on at lunchtime, I have the news on in the evening. And then I'm scrolling on my phone. Our modern technologies can sometimes put us at huge levels of despair. Um, but now we've been able to harness that incredible technology. I mean, the first couple of weeks, I was really looking at everything and drive myself a little mad and every day I do look at the figures from Spain and Italy in particular and you know my heart breaks. I don't understand why certain media outlets and certain people in the media and in broadcasting um, including colleagues of mine uh, start with vitriol. I think always start from a point of view of uh, compassion and attempting to understand because after all we're all in this together and people want to follow the rules but people also have to worry about their own mental well-being. <laughs> a lot of times I think the media um, they, they cover up. I think they're not telling us everything. They're focusing on all the negatives instead of the positive, because they're saying, oh, 4,000 people died um, within the last week, and, but they haven't said, oh, but 5,000 of those people have also recovered. <sighs> we know it's serious. We don't need to make, be made to worry more. I, I, I take everything with a pinch of salt. What you have to remember as well is that a lot of the stuff you read on Twitter and on Facebook doesn't come from outlets that have uh, proper journalistic sensibilities or even sometimes trained journalists um, who are willing to adhere to uh, a code of best practice. My biggest fear about COVID-19 is that after all of this is over, that we learn nothing. The thing I think that I'm frightened of is that actually nothing will change at the end of all this and we'll just jump back into our non-sustainable life. My biggest fear is one that I am going to vocalise once and once only because it is just too scary for me to even think about, so I don't think about it. It's if anything would happen to my children. Losing people. Losing people I love. 
the fear that I have at the moment isn't about myself. It's about other people and how they're going to pay their rent, how they're going to feed their family. Um, there's a lot of small businesses that won't be able to come back after this. I really, really fear that this will just be forgotten and swept under the carpet when we've got so much to learn from it. Oh, I think the hardest thing, I think I share this with, the, with pretty much everyone I spoke to about it, is the not knowing and what this virus is and how it can mutate. And it seems to be mutating um, as the weeks go on. And I think that uncertainty leads to fear and that fear can lead to chaos and worry. <sighs> But all of the secondary stuff, is the economy going to, just the world economy going to tank? I mean, I've got a three-year-old daughter, so just to think how fundamentally different her life is going to be to our life. If I get it, then there is a, an overwhelmingly good chance that my body will do exactly what it's designed to do and will fight off this disease. At this point, it's just waiting. I believe that there's a purpose to this experience that we're in, and we all have an opportunity to learn about how we could live in more harmony with the planet and with each other in a more equitable way, and how we could take care of each other and take care of the, of, of the world. I think as a country, I think the good thing is that we've re-evaluated what we think of as key workers, what we think or what we were thinking of as being unskilled work. Without those shell stackers, we wouldn't be functioning. Without those nurses who are on minimum wage or on a poor wage, we would not be functioning right now. I think what will be different in the world going forward are how much we trust our governments. Things are going to be a lot better at the end of this because we've sort of, it's sort of shown a lot of the cracks and the problems in society. I think this will probably change a lot of the way some world leaders behave. We're, we're going to sort of see a much more progressive society. I think obviously people are going to start tackling issues like climate change a lot more, hopefully. Does this mean that species are going to survive because we're not out there? Maybe this is what this is all about. Blue sky, clear water, singing birds. We are not flying as much. We are not using boats as much. We're not using our cars as much. Um, you know, we're not littering as much because we're not on the streets. Animals are roaming the streets kind of free. <laughs> yeah, lack of pollution, man. The ozone layer over China has fixed itself. We have green uh, thermo maps over parts of Europe for the first time probably since the Industrial Revolution started. Mother Nature is being able to breathe. You know, part of nature is, is restoring itself. This isn't the first time we're going to see something like this. You know, there's um, with global warming and um, what's happened to the earth, you know, there's going to be bigger, larger natural disasters. It's been a long time since we've had a worldwide pandemic like this, and we just forgot. We all just have to keep in mind that we are truly stewards of the earth, and um, it's our job to leave this a better place than when we found it. The things the entities we share the planet with really don't care about our artificial you know distinctions you know the planet will deal with us we've not thought until now that we are indestructible maybe we did push the world too much maybe we did do things that were stupid there's no way that the world would have stopped no way out of choice Poh, as if too busy, we're too busy, we're too busy. Sometimes I hear this phrase, when things get back to normal. I hope that since COVID has hit, that a lot of things will be different in the world now. I hope that we'll ration more and not consume as much. I've been thinking a lot about greed and like people's need for things and my own, this is, I'm including myself, my need for materialistic things to make me happy. I hope that we'll learn some lessons and that those lessons could be talked about in the future so that we could live um, in more harmony with the planet and with each other and uh, with less, less greed and less materialism. It's the same way that my parents used to talk about the war, really, is that they used to talk about rationing and it's very hard to imagine what these things are like unless you're in them. Now I have to ration my goals. Um, and work within limitations, so 
be smarter now. If we carry on in the way that we have done before COVID hit, things like climate change will only get worse and consumerism will only get worse. But being limited and rationed with ourselves uh, and our family, I hope will help us to realise just how precious the small things in our lives are. I don't need the things that I think I do. And I think that is a great lesson to learn. I think I would explain this series of events to future generations by saying we fucked up really bad. I will never forget the feeling of helplessness, of trying to help as many people as we can, but knowing that really we don't have the facility to be able to treat everybody, but also the feeling of helpfulness as well, and knowing that I can, um, I can help people in this situation. My lasting memory from being in quarantine is probably all the TikToks. Love, support. That we are all equal. We're just the same that we aren't in truth defined by lines on a map or who we voted for or what we say about ourselves or what we believe. I really wish I'd bought stock in Zoom before this. I would have made a lot of money on that. I've actually been in tears many times because of the kindness and the caring that I've been hearing about um, and receiving. And um, I think that, that really, you know, when we suddenly need each other, we be begin to behave more humanly towards each other. I really, really hope that there is a lot more investment into science because of this. Change is forged in the crucible of crisis um, and seismic world events tend to uh, result in societal change. What I've learned so far is that we have to take it day by day. People can come together in times like this. You can't wish something into being, you can't worry something away, but you can do something about it. People do matter, and our feelings and our health really does matter. Can you stay two metres away from me, please? No, I can be close to you. Laughter predates language by 20,000 years, and it's important to try and do normal stuff and have fun and put a smile on your face as well, because we're going to need that to get through it. Everyone is doing the best that they can. We stay positive and we hope. We could bounce back stronger. Myself and my family have been more in contact in the last couple of weeks than we usually are in the space of six months. I think as a society, as people, as the world, we're a little bit more connected. But the babies that have been born during quarantine in 13 years' time it's going to be the rise of the quarantines. I say like quarantines because they're teenagers. I certainly feel that it's our job to make this period as good as we can. So that's what I'm trying to do. I think it could actually be the, I mean, after this, I think it could be the, the greatest age of humanity ever. And we'll see you on the other side of all of this. Just like you'd wear underpants, people are going to be wearing masks after this.